In this episode of Detroit Performs, a muralist who also specializes in a rare but historic art form. A sculptor searches the past to create art for the present. And what our featured artists have to say about the city of Detroit. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm at the Detroit Mercantile Company located in Detroit's historic Eastern Market. In today's episode, we're featuring artists who are bringing back some ancient forms to create some of their work, as well as looking into the past, present, and future of our city. Our first segment features painter Hubert Massey, whose murals are sprinkled all throughout Motown. He is also one of only a few in the country who professionally creates frescoes, a form of painting once done by cavemen and epitomized by Michelangelo. Let's take a look. Being able to create something from nothing and uh, being able to have something to outlast me uh, has been my, my strong passion. I grew up uh, in uh, Flint, Michigan, moved to Mount Morris, Michigan, and went to Flint Beecher High School. I've been drawing since I was about six years old. I don't know, it was really fascinating for me just to, just to draw pictures when I was really young. But uh, until I got into college and I went away to, uh, to Europe and I got to see a lot of the master painters, just really uh, fueled my energy to wanting to be an artist. I love history. When I was in Europe, I seen the, the cartoon drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. I seen the, some of the pieces of uh, Peter Paul Rubin. They were monumental, like 20 feet by 15 feet or so. It was just a you know, true inspiration for me. I got hired two years before I got out of college to come here to the city of Detroit to work for uh, a sign company. Uh, the sign company were billboards that were 14 by 48. Some billboards were 20 feet by 72 feet or so. And all billboards were all hand painted up until about the early 90s or so. So I came in a time when uh, most of the sign painters were hand painting billboards 40 to 50 hours a week. So every day, painting billboards and oil paints and uh, mixing colors just really honed in my uh, skill quite a bit. You talk about artists in the Renaissance period, they didn't have the media coverage that we have now. So it was, it was uh, the, the artwork was done in public places. So people communicated to one another and talked about, well, you need to see this artwork that's done by this artist, Michelangelo, and the word travel. So the same thing for public art. When you do a piece of public art, and, and it's done well, and it's done with the quality of materials. It can last for hundreds of years, and it can last for thousands of years. And uh, just the mere fact that uh, being able to create a piece of artwork that has a major impact upon communities and, um, and has a major impact upon environment, it's just it really intrigued me. How I became more of a fine artist is, I just saw the technology had changed, and uh, I had just bridged over and uh, did the Athenium Hotel. The Athenium Hotel was my first commission in the city of Detroit. It was a 30 foot by 15 foot diptych, and uh, it was all done in oils. So I, while I was working at the sign company, I was um, uh, painting at the Athenium Hotel. And when the technology changed and uh, uh, people were laid off, I just had already bridged, and I said, you know what, I enjoy doing this. And plus, it was an opportunity to do things in public places. And so my uh, pursuit of doing public art was intensified just by doing that one project. My inspiration comes from when, uh, doing the community forums when I do large pieces that are public pieces. Inspiration comes from the stories that they tell me. Some of those stories are historical stories and all. 
And I get really inspired to listen to those stories and to create those pieces of artwork. Just like a person who hears uh, a story and turns it into a song and uh, it becomes uh, lyrics and the lyrics are beautiful and it paints a picture. So I paint the pictures of just creating the artwork using uh, the stories that come from the community. The one at CCS is a large tile mural. Uh, it's about 30 feet by 30 feet. The piece represents uh, the community. There's a, there's a woman that's holding a child and with a single thread she creates this quilt and the quilt wraps around this entire community. So there is a lot of historical type of iconic things that uh, I just wanted to make sure I put inside the, the paintings. The Florida the Charles H. Wright Museum, uh, I won an international contest. Uh, I had just completed the Athenium Hotel. So I ended up um, designing a terrazzo floor. Uh, one of the things that intrigued me was the materials and the medium that, that went into it. The floor uh, depicts uh, the history and the culture of African American experience. On one side, it has an African American woman leaning over an African American youth has lost his life in uh, violence. And on the other side, it has an African woman leaning over an uh, African man or woman who lost his life in the Middle Passage uh, when they were brought over on, on the ships. The design is uh, based upon the empowerment of African Americans and it's a celebration piece that celebrate African American experiences. Paradise Valley Park uh, really talks about the history and the culture of um, Detroit uh, back in the 20s or so when a lot of entertainers came to Detroit. It was like Harlem. Um, uh, you have Cab Calloway, Diane Washington, and a lot of other entertainers that used to come here. And uh, this walkway is actually just to celebrate the people who used to come in and out of the city of Detroit back in the 20s or so, 20s or 30s and um, the deep root culture in jazz and, and music and, and poetry. This right here is, there's three layers. It takes three layers of plastering for fresco. And the reason why is because when you uh, paint on the surface, you don't want the surface to, to dry out real fast. So you have to have three layers. The frescoes that I've done around the city of Detroit are the ones at the Detroit Athletic Club. Um, those were the first frescoes done since 1932. There hasn't been anybody do any commission fresco paintings in Detroit since 1932 until I did those. But the second largest fresco that I've done to the Rivera is at the Flint Institute of Arts Museum. So it's uh, 17 feet by 88 feet long. And then the other fresco that I did was at the Richard DeVall Center. Uh, is seven feet by five feet. This, this fresco, particular fresco, was my roofer. And my roofer was doing the roof and I said, man, that looks really sharp. He wears a derby when he does the roof. And uh, so I decided to do a picture of him. And uh, so I, I took a couple of pictures of him and all, and I said, well, I'm gonna do a portrait of him. And this is what I did. Sort of the origin of fresco, if you think of an ancient cave wall, Okay, and you're talking about thousands of years ago, and you walk into this cave, and this cave is all filled with limestone, okay? And it's kind of damp a little bit. Then you decide to pick some dirt off the ground, which sort of is kind of reddish-like, so it's, it's dirt that's kind of oxidized and all. You mix it with a little water, and you paint these animals and pictures up on the wall. That's a form of fresco. That's the earliest form of fresco. So there's a lot of math that goes into it. It's, it's breaking up space. That's one of the biggest things. How do you design something that's 20 feet by 120 feet or so? Where do you start at? Do you start in the middle? Do you start to the left? Do you start to the right? So you have to have an armature. You have to have a structure that's already built. Then you can put the outside, the layers on top of it. So for composition wise, it's done the same way. This piece is, I, I use a, a, a system called uh, dynamic symmetry or golden ratio or golden means. They used to use that a long time ago. And what it does is that it allows me to break up space, create my compositions, 
and be accurate on where I want my images to be. It's probably one of the hardest mediums to work with. You gotta be extremely confident in your skill level. One thing that's nice about Fresco, it crosses many different disciplines. It's, it's design, it's the ability to paint, uh, it's the ability to do things logistically because on a fresco, there is no room for errors. So what you put down stays down. If there's a drip on the surface of a fresco, it absorbs into the wall, it stays there permanently unless you decide that you have to tear out all what you started for that day just to render that type of area. One of the main things I like to do is I just like to see the uh, revitalization of fresco paintings being done uh, right here in the city of Detroit because uh, the frescoes that we have from Diego Rivera is the largest fresco in the United States. It's right here in the D. And I always tell people Detroit is 300 years old. It was the second largest city in America, you know, and there's a lot of history and a lot of culture here. And I just love to have the world just to see all the wonderful things that we have done here. You can learn more about Hubert Massey and all the other artists featured here today on DetroitPerforms.org. Artist Eric Yorn creates sculptures from mythology, bringing back stories from the past that still hold meaning in today's world. Let's take a look as he creates the art of the Norsemen. Javadica actually came from two different sources. Uh, it was originally uh, using the name Javatu, which was a Sanskrit name for uh, life, so the exploration of life. And then uh, along came a company called Novaka, which was all about world uh, art from, from all different cultures. And uh, so I sort of merged those two together, and it's an ex exploration not only of life and the life experience, but also of, uh, of cultures around the world. I really like to explore the human imagination as it manifests through things like myth, through things like story. And so uh, since those are all intangible things, I try to give it form through my sculpting. I think the thing that originally got me interested in myth, uh, my, my father would read me the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was, you know, two feet tall. Um, I saw Star Wars when I was seven. I read Joseph Campbell when I was in high school. These are all things that, uh, along with many, many others, uh, led to a very deep passion for uh, mythology and a great interest in, in the stories that they convey. A lot of my own inspiration, the way that I sort of get started on a new piece, uh, is in uh, doing research, doing reading, getting inspired, you know, I'll go online and I'll, I'll find things. Um, looking at other artists and what they're doing. Uh, but it, it, it really, it, it takes input before an artist can give, you know, output. And, um, and so I try to, to take in as much as I can. I try to learn about uh, history and mythology every chance I get. In the Sculpting Myth series, I've been starting with uh, Norse and Celtic and Germanic and many of the European, and then I'll move on to uh, you know, African and Asian and, and, uh, and Native American. It doesn't have any form. It's not something you can really um, uh, experience in a physical way until the artist comes in and, and gives it shape. So um, exploring my own background as a Scandinavian, uh, and delving into those Norse myths and trying to interpret those symbols that were so key to that, to that culture. I think what inspires me the most about my pursuit of, of these specific uh, images is that they do kind of capture uh, many of the, the lesser known aspects of Norse mythology. You know, today most people look at Vikings and they think helmets with horns on them and I'm trying to reintroduce uh, this wonderfully rich culture that was the uh, the Norse myth. Currently I've got two projects going uh, that I'm roughing in this week. I've got uh, Hugin and Munin who were uh, the two ravens of Odin who was the sort of the chief uh, god, the all the all father 
the Norse mythology. And uh, they're uh, portrayed here perched on uh, a rune stone, which was a very common way of communication uh, among the Nordic people. And uh, on the rune stone is carved uh, Odin sitting astride Sleipnir, which was his eight-legged horse. And uh, the other piece I'm working on is um, uh, the prow of a Viking ship. And I'm actually going to be doing uh, several different variants on this piece. Uh, but I think these two images, along with the other ones I've already done, uh, really uh, seek to capture what the Norse mythology was all about. Casting, especially wax, lost wax, goes back thousands of years. Um, I do sort of a modern version of that uh, in that I'm cold casting. Uh, so I'm using cold cast metals, cold cast stone. Every once in a while I will do a, a hot cast uh, metal piece as well. But um, it's a technique that goes back, you know, millennia. Uh, so in keeping with that moving forward and doing my relief work or my freestanding sculptures, I very much think that I'm keeping uh, not only an art form in front of everybody, but more specifically, I'm, I'm hoping to bring forth the myths. I'm attempting to remind people of the stories that uh, they may have forgotten, they may never have known. Uh, the importance of our uh, personal heritage, you know, even as the world becomes more and more homogenized, uh, it's important to still hang on to those things that uh, that made us unique and continue to make us unique. The Detroit Mercantile Company features a curated collection of new and vintage items made right here in Detroit, the state of Michigan, and the country. Now, here's some upcoming events happening in and around the Motor City. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit Ixity.com. All of our featured artists here at Detroit Performs have a deep love for Detroit and make sure to let it be known. Let's take a look back as they share their thoughts about the past, present, and visions for the future of this vibrant, proud city of ours. Detroit comes into my art in just about every aspect. I always felt like um, Detroit was a special place. It has a soul. Oh, Detroit, I just love it because, I mean, it's where I'm from. Detroit has been fantastic for me. Everything looks upward here, you know, and so whatever you do, you're going up. So I like that. I love Detroit. I hope that it continues to do well. I have always been for the underdogs and I I love the music in Detroit, you know, so that, that's another thing. It's part of, uh, when I first came back, there was like, oh God, I forgot. There's all these like free summer music events. And you know, I'm out there like dancing with 300 people, you know, and it's great. Detroit was uh, the mecca for music for so many years. So many creative talents have, have uh, come out of Detroit. And when you think about the Motown era, you think about, uh, uh, stack records, you think about Universal, you think about all the uh, other companies that have produced major people, musicians as well as lyric writers. I just love like the surrounding 
like this area of Detroit for some reason and just like old and so many historical buildings and sites you can go to just it's really fascinating. I'm very inspired by uh, just going going to galleries in Detroit and being inspired by the art. I, I can really take from that and then create my own style from it. You see and you feel uh, the presence of Detroit in my music and you see the presence of Detroit in the artwork also. Detroit plays a role because not only are we like from this area, but also it plays a big role in where we get shows. A lot of your audience that you're getting is going to be in Detroit. And then sometimes you get students from Detroit and they really want to, you know, learn what you've done. So it's just inspiring the people of Detroit and saying we, there are these amazing things in Detroit that you can see. So just got to get out there and see them. I love Detroit, especially um, after spending time in San Diego. Uh, there's a really tight-knit community here and everybody helps each other and you know if we need like a fire performer for a show or a hooper, we know a ton of people and out there it seems to be a little more um, like everybody's kind of doing their individual thing. Here it's like, oh hey, you gotta meet my cousin and then this is my yoga teacher and you know, and I love that about Detroit. It, it's really refreshing and whatever the cliches are about the Midwest, I think it's a really positive thing. And the uh, Detroit audience, you know, and, and the part of the support, I think they've been, um, you know, fantastic. I think they have uh, pushed me to be, you know, go to the next level, next step. Uh, and also, it gives you a lot of strength here. Detroit really seems to be on the cusp of a renaissance. And as an artist, it's so exciting to see and yet so frustrating because you want it to happen that much faster. You know, I, I just want to be able to wave a magic wand and, and have it be everything that it, it could be. And we, I think, know that it's going to be a, a journey. And of course, for a lot of artists, including myself, the decay of the, of the place is interesting. You know, I, I hate to say it callously, because I know there's a lot of pain that goes through with that, but um, in the sense that, like, if you go to places in Europe, you see ruins. And we don't really have that here in the U.S and I actually find it very visually interesting. And so there's, there's just some, there's sort of an earthiness that I love about Detroit. I never didn't have faith. You know, sometimes, you know, you have to be closest to your death to really realize like how alive you are, you know? And so it's like Detroit going through so much struggle and being so close to sort of dissolving in, in some ways. We are closest to our rebirth than um, maybe some other places. There's still a lot in Detroit that's not a perfect picture and a perfect world, but there's a lot of love, there's a lot of passion, and I am very fortunate to be an American artist living in the Detroit metro area. Um, I encourage everybody to come on out and take a look at the artists, the landscapes, and the people and the music of Detroit. It's going to take time. It's going to take many people uh, coming and, and uh, and giving to, to the city uh, to make it what it, it really could be. And I hope that through my art, uh, bringing a sense of mythology, bringing a sense of uh, traditional techniques, uh, as I do through my pottery, bringing back story like I do through my own uh, sculpting work, uh, will help contribute to that, to that process. We have this opportunity to recreate ourselves and to continue to grow, and it's like, we are a strong city. I mean, I lived in New York for a year, and I thought, well, I'm gonna go out to New York, and I'm gonna find, find my way, I'm gonna play music, and it was like, when I came back to Detroit, I was so grateful to have such an amazing community to come back to that just, you know, had their arms out waiting, and I just think that we are a brave city. You know, <laughs> if, if it's my place to be proud, well, then I'm the proudest. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly how Detroit performs. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We'd like to thank the Detroit Mercantile Company for letting us come by here today. Make sure you check out some made in Detroit items for yourself next time you come in. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. 
Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.